I'm in kind of an interesting position in that I know that nearly everything I produce will be wrong. That is, I know that the kinds of stories I tell, the kinds of scenarios I create about what 2015, 2020, 2050 may look like, I know that these scenarios will be incorrect in terms of being accurate depictions of those moments. However, it's my belief that these are useful ways of thinking through implications. I don't like using the word prediction. I don't make predictions. What I try to do is offer um, conjectural implications, conjectural provocations, knowing that in no case will this be an accurate depiction of what 50 years out will hold, but also knowing that in every case there will be nuggets, there will be elements of these stories that will be uh, resonant. So what I ended up doing is creating a set of three 50-year scenarios, the long crisis, emergence, and the great transition, each of which describing a different uh, outcome for the world over the course of the next 50 years. The one that seems to, to stand out for most people is the one that we call the long crisis. Uh, that's the one that really does look at what happens when things do fall apart and the center does not hold. This is a story of environmental crisis, of political crisis, of a 40-year recession, an economic crisis greater than we've seen you know, in over a century. It's a story of what happens when institutions that we have come to rely upon fail us. So while the, the long crisis scenario includes something like 50 different data points, a few stand out as being particularly interesting to a lot of people and particularly important to think about in terms of the direction of this scenario. The first is probably the culmination of the conflict between India and Pakistan in this scenario occurring in the early 2020s. Initially, it's just a continuation of the simmering border conflict between the two countries, but this one gets out of hand. And by 2024, we actually see a, a limited nuclear exchange between the two countries. And this is devastating, obviously, to the billions of people who live in this region and, and beyond. But it's also devastating to the environment in that it throws into the atmosphere megatons of material that, that blocks out sunlight, that basically throws an already chaotic global cl climate environment into, into chaos. So it's in this same time period, now this is roughly the 2020s into the early 2030s, that um, the crisis for the U.S. ends up being more economic than environmental. And certainly the environment is having an impact on, on the U.S., but this is a world where the U.S. ends up defaulting on its debt. Now this isn't impossible. This is something that we've seen happen time and again in other countries. It's been unthinkable for the U.S. to, in to do something like that, but that's simply because of our habits of thinking that we're accustomed to still thinking of the U.S. as the single global hegemon. And especially in this scenario, that's simply no longer the case. And in fact, what you see th across the world is the widespread recognition that traditional institutions of governance have failed, that the big country model has failed. And what you have as a result is the rise of secessionist movements across the spectrum of um, large institutional powers, not just the United States, but also in China, in the collapsing European Union, even in Russia. And what happens as we move into the 2030s is, is that these secessionist movements become stronger, the civil unrest turns you know, ominously close to civil war, and what you have in the U.S. is initially a relatively peaceful split into four different regions, essentially the Northeast, the West Coast, uh, the, the Southeast, and then something calling itself, you know, continuing to call itself the United States, which is essentially the Midwest. Um, Texas and, and Alaska go their own way, but that's, you know, hardly a surprise. So the secessionist moment in this scenario really only takes us through about half of the scenario's 50 years. And what we see in the, in the 20 odd years that follow, there is a, an emerging global famine that comes in part from environmental conditions, but in part from a, a terrorist attack, you know, an engineered wheat blight. Uh, there is an ocean extinction report, uh, an ocean extinction report that describes the, the ongoing impacts of, of ocean acidification because as useful as geoengineering may be to, to blocking the, the warming that's happening to the planet, it does nothing about the carbon. As bad as this scenario is, and the long crisis was intentionally created as a way of playing out some of the scarier implications and the bigger challenges we may face, um, there are points of hope. Uh, a, a joint U.S.-China mission to, to um, 
prevent a catastrophic asteroid strike. The development of you know, certain kinds of emerging technologies that allow for much greater awareness of environmental outcomes, much greater control over the environment. The emergence of new models of economics, new models of resilience that allow for organizations, once they you know, recognize that a, that a new world is here, once they recognize that um, older institutions are no longer functioning, actually give them something to step forward into. The reality is that human civilization is remarkably resilient. In dealing with these kinds of crises before, in dealing with these points of near catastrophe before, we have time and again come up with new models, new ideas, innovations and surprises that actually allow us to create a better world out of the ashes of the old.